Hi, this is Mallory Nye, and welcome to episode 12 of the Histories Inc. podcast series. Now, in this episode, I'm going to do things a wee bit differently. A couple of weeks ago, I got contacted by people at the Think Jam PR company who were doing the publicity for the new Martin Scorsese film that is out on the 1st of January 2017 under the title of Silence. They wanted me to go and see a preview of the film and to basically make some comments about it. I'm based up in Perth in Scotland and the film was showing down in London at the Odeon Leicester Square so it's quite a distance so they agreed to send me down on the train and um, I had to take the sleeper back almost immediately after the film. They thought I got something that might be worth saying about this particular new film by Martin Scorsese. So I said yes, and it was, it is a film about religious issues. It's a film with a very strong historical context, which bring together quite a few of my interests. And I thought this would add something in many ways to my discussion of what we're talking about in the field of history, what we're talking about in the field of religion, and what we can say about this particular cultural artifact, this this piece of art, this piece of cinema, exploring um, the experiences of two Jesuits, one particular Jesuit, a tale told about uh, Japan in the 17th century and the spread or the persecution of Christianity within that context. So here goes, I'm going to be talking in particular about Martin Scorsese's 2016-2017 film titled Silence, starring Liam Neeson and Andrew Garfield in the roles of two particular Portuguese Jesuits who travelled to Japan in the 17th century. So, I hope you see how it fits in uh, with the the other themes of this podcast series. Now, in many respects, this new film by Martin Scorsese titled Silence is a film that does explore belief, faith and religion, and very specifically Catholic Christianity. The director Scorsese's primary concern appears to be exploring the faith of a man, particularly a man of God, in a hostile environment where for him the hoped-for divine voice is silent. However, there's also a much more important theme to the movie, one which I feel is hidden in plain sight. Scorsese's silence is first and foremost an exploration of race and empire. Ironically, perhaps, this takes on new and challenging meanings as we fearfully enter the age of Trump. When I say this, I don't mean this is in any sense an either-or between either religion or race. The two, for me, are different sides of the same coin. That is, the idea of religion is primarily about exploring and classifying differences. It's also about the exertion of power to influence and control others. Likewise, the idea of race is about how Europeans have constructed such differences. And it is these issues that are central to the narrative of this particular movie. How, after all, do we watch a film that has at its heart depictions of Japanese soldiers in prison camps using increasingly unpleasant forms of torture on their subjects? We know this narrative so well already through film, or even though in silence we are in the 1640s, not the 1940s. On the other hand, John Fox's 1563 Book of Martyrs gives us an abundance of cases of Christians being tortured and executed because of their religion. Just one small example is the case of Helen Stark, who was drowned by a religious tribunal in Perth Harbour in Scotland in 1544, apparently for the crime of failing to call on the Virgin Mary during her childbirth. So what is added to the story when the torture and violence is in Japan and it involves a naive European priest seeking to save souls? This, for me, is where the issue of race comes in. The film Silence is an adaptation of a book of the same name that Scorsese read two decades ago. It was by the Catholic Japanese writer Shusaku Endo. 
It tells the story of a young Portuguese Jesuit seeking both a mission and martyrdom in 17th century Japan. During a time of harsh punishments of Christians by the recently centralized Japanese state. The English language translation of Endo's book, Silence, Chinmoko in Japanese, which was written in 1966, is faithfully rendered onto the screen by Scorsese, with perhaps the main innovation being a brief concluding epilogue that makes explicit what are otherwise rather ambiguous snippets in the book. However, there is a fundamental difference between a book written in Japanese for a Japanese audience and a film written in English for consumption mainly in North America and Europe. Despite his meticulous exploration of the complex themes of Endo's writing on faith and Christianity in Japan, the Western audience will read the message of Scorsese's version of the story through their own particular historical perspectives. That is, the film is about early European colonialism in Asia, whether we look at it in narrowly religious terms or otherwise. It's not by choice or mere circumstances that these two Portuguese missionaries are in Japan in the 1640s. We see them first in the context of Portuguese Macau, an established European colony in East Asia, at the end of a chain of such colonies linking back through Malacca, Goa and Africa to Portugal. The presence of these two Jesuits might be ideological and primarily about faith, but they are also part of an army of Christian missionaries who represent, rely on and also advance the colonial and commercial interests of the Portuguese Empire. In this context, they were no strangers to the use of coercive violence against those who opposed such colonialism and also those who resisted or deviated from the religious power of the Catholic Church. Portugal had itself expelled its religious minorities in recent decades, including Jews, Muslims and Protestant heretics. The Inquisition was indeed brought into Asia by the pioneering Francis Xavier one of the earliest Jesuits, who travelled through India, Southeast Asia, Japan and China a century before, in the 1540s. Thus, although Endo's Japanese novel is about reclaiming a hidden Christian history within Japan, this film by Scorsese serves more to educate a Western audience about a forgotten element of the spread of Jesuit-based Catholicism in East Asia. It could even be argued that it's about Japan's successful resistance to European colonialism and domination during this time. After all, the context of the film is the initial stage of the two-century closing of Japan, Sakoku, or Keikin, as historians have come to describe this time, strictly regulating the Europeans' attempts to trade with, influence and colonise parts of Japan. As elsewhere in Asia and Africa, the spread of Christianity was a very important part of such empire building. This closure was eventually ended by colonial powers through force after the US sent gunboats into Tokyo Bay in 1853. The focus of the story of silence is on one particular man, Father Sebastian Rodrigues, played by Andrew Garfield who is portrayed as young, idealistic and struggling with his Christian faith. He enters a situation in which he expects danger, torture and quite possibly death. His narrative is one of becoming aware of his inability to link this to the main Christian stories of redemption through suffering, either Jesus in Gethsemane and on Golgotha, or otherwise the early Christian martyrs. Always ahead of Rodriguez, is the image of his teacher and mentor, Father Cristavo Ferreira, played by Liam Neeson, who is reported as having refused martyrdom and instead accepted apostasy, that is, a public refutation of his Christian faith to become a Buddhist. Although the character of Rodriguez is fictional, the bones of Ferreira's story are historical. Within this path to early martyrdom or apostasy is not merely the Jesuits' fear of torture, 
Rodriguez also has to face and take responsibility for the torture and death of those who he is meant to be serving, that is, the hidden Christians of Japan. To what extent can a European Jesuit priest reconcile his self-glorification in martyrdom and a refusal to apostatize against the pain and suffering of others because of him? By renouncing his faith, he can save those others. To Scorsese, this exploration is primarily a matter of faith and theology. It's an exploration of the morality and piety of a man of faith. As Scorsese has written, Rodriguez believes with all his heart he will be the hero of a Western story that we all know very well. The Christian allegory, a Christ figure with his own Gethsemane, a patch of wood and his own Judas, a miserable wretch named Kichijiro. Silence, for Scorsese, is the story of a man who learns so painfully that God's love is more mysterious than he knows that he leaves much more to the ways of men than we realise, and that he is always present, even in his silence. But for me, the film is much more than this. Indeed, in this case, the religious is the political. There is no pure kernel of theology in this narrative. It's about both an individual man's and a European empire's constructions of religion, race and power. It's about the connection between white male European identity and Catholic Christianity within a seemingly alien environment, among a people, the Japanese, who are constructed as an alien and different race. Rodriguez enters this narrative with a clear aim to be a white saviour of souls. Indeed, he finds his most satisfying role when providing his priestly services to Japanese Christians held in a Nagasaki prison, where the threat of their torture and execution is ever-present. In his final dilemma, between martyrdom or apostasy, either decision he makes allows him to fulfil his destiny as male white saviour within this colonising context. The focus on Rodriguez is part of the faithfulness of the film to the original novel, but it does put at a distance the complexities of the people this European Christian missionary has travelled so far to serve. In a film of over two and a half hours, there's not enough space to provide a deep characterization on any of the Japanese characters, despite an excellent cast of actors who also bring some humorous relief to the density of the narrative. The ambiguous Kichijiro is the most complex. He is clearly a flawed person, although himself a Christian. He is apostatized several times to the extent it is joked about, and is flaky and untrustworthy enough to be cast by Rodriguez into the role of Judas. And yet, with comedic timing, he turns up regularly demanding from the priest the opportunity to confess. He has that rare quality of being both dislikable and likable. At the same time, though, his role is to be part of Rodriguez's own inner struggle. There are several other key Japanese characters that contribute to Rodriguez's apotheosis, including the Christian village elders Mokichi and Ichizo, and the sinister and creepy inquisitor or persecutor Inoue. Most notable for me, however, was the character of Inoue's assistant, who is simply known as the interpreter, whose role it is to translate between Inoue's Japanese and Rodriguez's Portuguese, which is rendered in the film as English. In the novel, the interpreter is seen very much through Rodriguez's eyes, and so appears harsh and largely set on destroying him. However, in the film, there is some sympathy for him. He is familiar with the vagaries of Portuguese mission and colonialism and comes across as a contemporary anti-colonial firebrand. During scenes of torture and execution, the interpreter is upset and expresses his regret, but he also affirms to Rodrigues his own ideology that the use of violence to suppress Christianity is both necessary and avoidable, so long as the Jesuit does what he needs to do, that is, to apostatize. 
And so for me, the key notes of the film are not in the questions of what happens to Rodriguez's faith journey. These are subsumed within the wider issues that are explored in two scenes towards the end of the main narrative. In the first of these, in a dialogue between Rodriguez and Inoue, the Inquisitor uses two metaphors to justify the Japanese response to the Portuguese. He raises an example, somewhat androcentric and misogynist, of a husband with four different wives, who cause so much trouble for him that he divorces all four. Of course, the male-centred misogyny of these metaphors is left unchallenged, both in the film and the original book, but the issue they alert, allude to is clear. There is a powerful struggle going on, which the centralised Japanese state wishes to control, to master literally in the metaphor, as a man in the context of a troublesome marriage. The four wives are explicitly meant to refer to the four colonial powers, all of whom were exploring Japan in various ways at the time. The Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch and the English, all causing troubles. And in response to this, Rodriguez says, don't take any of those wives, have a faithful relationship with one spouse, one partner, one wife, which would be the Catholic Church. But then, in a way, turns the discussion in a different direction, again using a very androcentric, misogynist idea of the problem of a man with an ugly wife, as he describes, a wife who won't leave him alone, that he doesn't want. And that he means in specifically referring to Christianity, and particularly the Catholicism, the unwanted advances of this Christian church that is trying to Catholicize, to Christianize the Japanese people. So building upon this, in Rodriguez's eventual meeting with Father Ferreira, the apostate Jesuit attempts to convince the once idealistic Rodriguez of the futility of seeking to support Japanese Christianity. Ferreira likens Japan to a swamp in which the roots of Christianity can't grow, since they will always rot away. Even the Christianity that once flourished briefly in the 16th century, shortly after the initial contact of Francis Xavier and the Jesuits, even that was not successful, since, according to Ferreira, it was based on falsehoods and misunderstandings. Ferreira argues, in particular, that the Japanese are not culturally disposed to Christianity, since they are more interested in ideas of humanness rather than divinity. In the end, it comes down to race, culture, and ideas of difference. Whether we agree with Ferreira in the book, or otherwise the two narrators of this story, that is Endo and Scorsese, this film is an English-language, American-produced narrative about the history of particular forms of European, specifically Portuguese, but also, out of nation-states, Roman Catholic colonialism. The film explores that narrative with beautiful imagery, thoughtful characterization, and quite a degree of wit and humour. But inasmuch as it focuses on the narrative of a single religious man's faith development, it fails to challenge the much wider issues of race and empire that frame Rodriguez's questions. In this respect, it's certainly a tale about the modern world. That is, in sum, the narrative of silence can't simply be reduced to one particular person's faith, as this man finds his path through the silence and the voice of God, despite those being the best intentions of the director. It is instead the much bigger historical colonial picture that frames the meanings that we should take from this exploration of the trials of Rodriguez and the people to whom he brings suffering. What is presented to us as the religiously personal is in fact profoundly political, and the focus of his religion and faith is also very much a focus on European constructions of race and difference. Behind that is also the complexity of constructions of empire and its resistance. I would have liked to see these themes made more explicit by Scorsese, even if such an approach went against the grain of his desire to explore and represent the issues of faith that clearly fascinate him so much. 
His choice to make such a film about this particular colonial moment of Portuguese Catholic missionaries in Japan in the 1640s set him the mainly unfulfilled challenge of asking difficult questions, not only of faith, but about our assumptions of white racial identities that are highly relevant to the world we now find ourselves living in. So, the film itself, as I speak, is due out in the UK uh, and the rest of Europe on the 1st of January 2017. I believe it's already on release through America. It is a film worth seeing. I hope I haven't spoiled too much about the plot, the storyline, and the themes. And if you enjoy sumptuous historical dramas about faith, this is a film that you will probably enjoy, albeit a rather long film, over two and a half hours. That's it for today. As I said at the beginning, my intention was to do something slightly different with this episode of the podcast, to explore some of the broader themes of the podcast series through this particular medium of the film, because I had the opportunity to go and see it and think about it. And for me, it's a very interesting means by which to explore the general themes. And I will probably be coming back to similar sorts of issues, a similar sort of approach of themes within the narratives of culture that we explore through our participation in, through things such as films and books and so on. So thanks for listening today, and I'll see you in the next episode soon. Bye for now.